right, still 23 degrees sideways. We're going to talk about anecdotes, small worlds, chaos, networks, distributism, and why a lot of people just really don't get math. And yes, math, M-A-T-H. It's a colloquial shortening of mathematics. Um, on the left, the, the elitist progressives like to say that if you, if you didn't say maths, then you're incorrect and you're stupid. And that's one of those things that I, I, I laugh at because I actually understand how colloquial language works. And um, if you don't, then, well, frankly, <laughs> you're too stupid to be arguing with me. So, math. Statistics is a very odd discipline, okay? It is it is not a science. It is an art. Um, it's a technology. It has... There are, there are applications of scientific method, okay? But math, math is a language. Math is a linguistic pursuit. It's a very tightly rule-bound linguistic pursuit to describe reality. And when it doesn't describe reality, it is functionally useless, okay? You know, you can talk about mysterious metamaths where... 2 plus 2 equals 5, and whatever, and has nothing to do with critical race theory. It's just making up different math languages for fun. I can make an Esperanto arith arithmetic where all addition follows a Fibonacci sequence. Whatever! Doesn't matter, it's just a mental jack-off. Statistics... It is, it is a very broad discipline, and if you really get into some understanding of it, you can make predictions, measurements, with very odd sets and quantities of data. Uh, so, deaths from starvation in the United States are under 300 every year. I, I've said this before, and it's not quite true, but it's one of those things that is statistically insignificant. Now, it's not insignificant if you're one of those 300 people or their families, but it is broadly, in terms of an entire third of a billion people population, it is statistically inconsequential, invisible. So to make it to make the statistics, to make the math describe the reality, you have to drop your your framework down to where it does where, to to the reality that you're addressing. Okay, and then then you can actually talk about these 300 deaths and come to some conclusions. They may not be prescriptive conclusions. You may not be able to say we can prevent these 300 deaths by passing this law because that that's not that's not the intention of statistics that's how people try to use it try to squeeze it into a box to do that but that's really not not what it's for what it's about it's just language to describe reality help us learn more about where we are what we're doing where we can go you know i can i can take those 300 cases and it's 300 man you can get so in depth you can analyze every detail, and I can figure things out about those poor, unfortunate people, less than 300, who died of starvation, and I can, I can talk about it, you know, but I can't make a political campaign to get more power or money out of it. And that, that's, that's pretty, pretty key there. So we have a bunch of anecdotes on the internet. Um, I'm going to tell you something that's it's one of those truisms that's that's become popular recent recently. The plural of anecdote is data. Um, an anecdote is a data point. Okay, well, how you treat that data point, what credence you give it, where you put it, how you log it, what kind of statistical universe you're modeling, all those things are variable, but the anecdote is a piece of data. It is a datum. The plural of anecdote is data. And if you've got dozens of people reporting that they have been listed as already voted, then you know that there's 
something going on. You don't know how pervasive it is, okay? But we've already done the calculus in the previous video that if the individual vote must matter, then the individual vote must matter. You have to treat cheating, interference, errors, just as important. You have to treat them with the same weight of importance if it's one little old lady versus 20,000 union members. It's this, you have to give it the same credence and importance. So if mail-in ballots have been turned in for people who then go to the polls to vote and are willing to swear, like really did not previously vote, have not s turned in ballots, you've got a problem. It may not be a huge problem, but it is a problem. And it's the kind of problem that can tear your country apart, okay? Because it's not about the outcome of the election now, it's about whether or not your vote matters. Whether or not you can trust the government to handle an election. That's a really big deal. Can you trust the government? Can you trust your government to handle your vote? Right now, for a lot of people, the answer is no. That's, that's a bad thing, man. You don't really want to go down that road too far because that road leads to violent places. So how how do you deal with this data? Because the people who the people who want to minimize the importance, um, whether it's for partisan reasons, because their guy wins if they get to ignore election cheating, um, or it's because they have a, a specific ideological commitment to the establishment, the authority, the system, whatever the system is. The people who minimize this, they're not... They tend to not be willing or able to handle the complications of reality, to handle fuzzy and fuzzy is the wrong word because it's been overused, but fuzzy mathematical language, fuzzy models, fuzzy events, um, systems, okay? And this is where it comes in. Systems theory, network topologies, ne just networks in general, network as, as a discipline. Um, some people st will still remember things like chaos, what you'd call chaos theory or... Uh, distributed networks. You know, the... the, the I'll, I'll just go with small worlds. Small worlds is probably the easiest thing to explain to people or to, to use as a phrase. I'm not really going to explain this very well. If you have these groups of people and, so, you know, you're dealing with Twitter. You've got this many reports on Twitter. It's from this group of people. It's all from people on this political end of the spectrum. And it's on Twitter. So you've got you've you've got these boundaries to your universe. Now can you extend that out to the broader universe? Well yes you can, but you have to do it intelligently. You have to do it with, with a certain amount of fuzziness too, okay? You have to use your small worlds as small worlds. They're pretty easy to understand, okay? So you, you, you don't get to deny it just because there's not enough of them for you to build a model. You don't get to deny it because you don't have a bounded population with controls. Because that's the other thing. And this is the big one for a lot of what's called the, 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 the self-described rationalists. Especially the self-described rationalists who are either libertarian or left. Politically left or libertarian. Is that they want... They will not accept data unless the data is in the model that they like. So you cannot accept the data unless the data is in your controlled study. Okay, the funny thing is that most of these people also rely on epidemiological data for just about every argument, but they really, really want single variable controlled studies. <laughs> And they're just not capable of handling multivariable statistics. Like, in their head, the existence of such a thing 
is too complex. You don't have to do the math. You, you don't have to be able to actually sit there and handle the the regressions. Okay, you you just we're talking about just being able to accept that these things do exist, being able to think about them. And I understand that most people can't. They can't just turn their brain into a different direction, take five, six variables and sort of like see the patterns in the map and you know, it's it's easier to see than describe if you can see them. But not not being willing to acknowledge the existence of data outside of a bounded field is a significant problem. You can, we can, the universe, the humans in the universe can model, make very good models off of very limited inputs if you understand how it works. Okay, there are things about human nature that you have you have to put you have to put psychology and behavior into your model and then you can look at your 17 reports. Right now, as I speak, the election has not been decided. It may be by the time this video goes up, who knows. I doubt it because I think the lawsuits are going to be going on for a while. Um, in Pennsylvania there are less than 100, less than 60 if, at the last time I checked, provisional ballots for Democrats. There are just about 300 provisional Democrats for Republicans. Provisional ballots for Republicans. That's a very odd thing. It's a very strange number, okay? The, the, the standard way the mythology works is that Democrats are the ones who come out to vote um, because every, every election is an emergency and so on, but they don't tend to be registered in advance. That's why you've got motor voter laws. There's a theory about... Um, it's actually a populist theory. that and, and that theory means that you're going to have more provisional ballots for Democrats because they're going to be the ones whose registration, who, who are doing same-day registration. Their registrations weren't right. They moved. They got arrested, but they got out of prison, but they had to move. And there, all the stuff, all the stuff that breaks your registration. So you have to cast a provisional ballot. Well, there's another reason to cast a provisional ballot, and that is that you are an AV, already voted. And you're disputing the ballot that came in as under your name. Hang on, this is going to be a little complicated here. So you're over here in an area that has traditionally got a fairly low turnout, okay? Now, Pennsylvania doesn't do bad. 60% turnout uh, for a presidential election on a normal year. That's not, that's not bad, okay? Um... The rural counties in Nevada do better, but then the urban counties don't. So, you know, Nevada is a good comparison because it's very close to the U.S. totals most years. And it has the same division. Like, you'll get 80%, 90% turnout in some rural areas and then 40% in some urban areas. It's kind of a interesting thing. But Pennsylvania does pretty good. 60%, it's a lot, you know. You've got a lot of sociological reasons for that. Now... There's areas. There's variations to that. It's a big state with a lot of different regions. So you take a region that tends to vote very little. Okay? 35, 45% turnout. You take that region and you target some specific populations, like older people or um, specific poor people. Trailer parks. Do the trailer parks, man. You take their mail-in ballots and you fill them out and you turn them in. Ballot harvesting. Illegal ballot harvesting because you're taking the ballots and filling them out. So this is literally fraud. But also ballot harvesting, which is just kind of a bad idea where you people don't vote. You gather their votes. You collect their votes. You're not a poll worker. You're not an election official. You're not at a polling place. You can wear a Biden shirt while you're harvesting the ballots. See, you can do electioneering. Ballot harvesting is a really bad thing. But whatever it is, ballot harvesting or actual fraud in filling them out, um, which is indicated by the provisional ballot numbers, you take these this area, these areas, and you gather some ballots. And this isn't like a party-wide thing. This isn't some organized thing. This is just some some 
person who feels that the election is very important and critical to the future of humanity and decides to gather up all the trailer park mail-in ballots and just poof. Do. Well, now people decide to go to the polls because it's such an important election because the media, because they've got the TV on all day, they're in trailer park. It's media, 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 media. And the media doesn't care what you're watching as long as you're watching because they own everything. Disney owns Fox. I mean, you can be like, oh, you horrible Fox. Fox is corporate media, man. Doesn't matter who you're watching. So you get all rent pumped up, and this time you go to the polls. Even though normally you don't. And hey, says you already voted. You got to cast a provisional ballot. Hmm. Now, I'm using trailer park on purpose because in a semi-rural area in a trailer park, you're going to find a lot of Republican voters, Republican registrants, but not likely voters, okay, for various reasons, whether it be meth, hangover, joblessness, job, because quite often these people, you know, you know, for every person who's <clears throat> living on drugs in a trailer park, there's a person who's supporting that habit with three jobs, you know. And I'm, I'm, try I'm not trying to be super mean about this, but there you go. So now you have a potential statistical universe, a situation, something to look for with this anom anomaly. Now, the anomaly isn't a lot of votes. It's a couple hundred votes. But what if that's like just two trailer parks? It's a huge deal. This is a very important thing. You have to actually go figure this out. You have to dig it in. You have to figure it out, okay? And it's the kind of thing that you can actually look at. You, you don't need very much information to come to this conclusion. You need only a couple little things, and you can come to a conclusion on this. Just a couple little extra pieces of information, and it doesn't take 10,000 survey responses or whatever bounded universe control model that you want. Random data, man. Just random little bits of data get put together. And if you really don't think that's true, I want you to explore the wild world of data mining and marketing. Because littlest pieces of data, random data, can tell a whole lot about you. They can also tell a whole lot about an election. Stay sideways and uh, think big, okay? Think broad.